Welcome. Thank you all for joining us. Um, you are here for our session, our panel on community and professional theater. And we're gonna be talking about, um, we'll define those terms, talk about some of the differences between them, and also talk about um, what both can learn from each other. And um, maybe, yeah, I'll let the panel go in its own direction from there. Um, but uh, my name is Derek Schwartz. I'm the program officer for theater at NIFA, and I will be facilitating this conversation. I am a um, white man with stubble and some kind of poofy brown, short brown hair and wearing clear rimmed glasses. Um, and I am calling in from the land of the Massachusetts Wampanoag and Nipmuc people in NIFA's office. Um, in what is now known as Boston, Massachusetts. Um, and I'm using he, him pronouns. Um, and I'm really excited to introduce our panelists today. Um, we're joined by Jacob Padrone, Julia Rosenblatt, and Bronwyn Sims. And in just a moment, I will hand it off to them to introduce themselves and we will launch into this exciting conversation. Um, I did just want to offer an access note that Leilani just posted the um, captioning link in the T in the Zoom chat. Um, so if you want to follow along with captions, you can do that by clicking that link or by clicking live transcript at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And with that, I will pass it off to our panelists. If you could just introduce yourself with your name, if you want to share your pronouns, where you're calling in from. Um, a visual description, and a little bit about your work. And I guess I can start it. I'll pass it to Jacob. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, great. Hi, I'm Jacob Padron. I use he, him pronouns. Um, I am the artistic director of uh, Long War Theater um, here in New Haven, and I'm also the founder and artistic director of The Soul Project based in New York. Um, I, am call I am calling in um, from the ancestral lands of the Quinnipiac, Wappinger, and Pagasset peoples, New Haven. Um, I am a brown skin Latinx man. Um, I have brown eyes, um, dark brown hair. Um, I'm wearing a white v-neck um, t-shirt and a flannel because it's cold. Um, behind me are some of my um, favorite pieces of art. Um, and also next to me uh, is a bookcase of books um, that provide inspiration. Um, and some are from grad school, some I kept from grad school. Um, and just really happy to be here with all of you as we talk about um, kind of the evolving landscape of the American theater relative to community-centered programming, community-centered theater. Thank you. Thanks, Jacob. Julia, do you want to go? Sure, I'm Julia Rosenblatt. I am uh, in Hartford, Connecticut, and um, I am. Let's see. I am the. I'm a co-founder of Heartbeat Ensemble here in Hartford, um, and uh, I'm still an ensemble member there. But I have um, moved on to start a the um, a theater program at Capital Community College, also in Hartford. Uh, I am uh, wearing a purplish um shirt with a um with a turtleneck type thing i've i'm white i have hair a little, a little above my shoulders um wearing earrings i'm in uh my bedroom which hopefully looks okay enough because today i don't teach so i am home <laughs> working from home today thanks julia and bronwyn Hi, everybody. My name is Bronwyn Sims. I go by she, her pronouns. I uh, don't have a video today. I'm sorry. My camera is broken, but I will describe myself. I'm a white Caucasian woman, uh, medium length hair with bangs, brown, blonde, uh, hazel eyes. Uh, I live in Nelson, New Hampshire, uh, land of the Abenaki. And um, I am a devised theater artist, independent artist right now. I don't uh, work with a specific company. And I'm also a visual artist and an athlete. 
Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, so I'm going to start with a really broad question, and any of you can take a stab at it. But I would love if we could define um, the terms that we're using today. So I would love to hear kind of the definitions that you use for community theater and professional theater. And then also if you could just speak a little bit for around where you see um, the importance of both of those within our theater landscape. Uh, I'll start. Yep. <laughs> or Jacob, do you want to start? No, um, oh, please go ahead. Go ahead, okay. Julia. Great. So de defining. Um, so to me, there's three different um, categories here. Community theater um, historically, I think, uh, refers to um, non-professional theater, people who are doing it um, as a hobby um, or, you know, studying certainly. Um, and uh, professional theater being those that are in the profession and paid. Um, and then a uh, another term that Heartbeat often uses is community-based, um, which uh, we use as that we are a professional theater company that is based in the community of Hartford um, and, and responsible for serving that community. Um, so th that's how I would define those three. What was the second part of the question? Um, if you could just speak to um, where you see the position of each of those, the importance of each of those within the landscape. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Um, yeah, I think, uh, well, I, hopefully it goes without saying that all three are, I think, really essential to the landscape and, and also acknowledging that the landscape is changing um, drastically as we speak. Um, so uh, for better and for worse, I think with a lot of different factors in there. Um, so community theater, uh, non-professional theater, um, it's what I grew up doing. It's what me, fell, me, brought me to, to love theater. Um, and also I met some of the most wonderful people um, from all over um, the, the state were doing it. Um, and, uh, and that's exactly what I think it, it, it provides. Um, it's a it's a wonderful wonderful opportunity to create theater and still have um, a career that pays you better than theater <laughs> um, for one thing. Um, so so that's absolutely um, it's a it's also a training base I think for a lot a lot a lot of actors um, a lot of students. Um, community based theater uh, I see a lot, also I should sort of the other term it, it's not always ensemble but but a lot of community-based theaters, um, there's also that we define ourselves as an ensemble as well. Um, so uh, a body of artists, a group of artists who work together over a long period of time to create a body of work. Um, that would be my definition of ensemble. I don't know where I got that, Sabrina. Um, so <laughs> um, so that that I think is, I mean, the our place in terms of the ecosystem um, is often creating new work. Um, for Heartbeat, it is almost entirely new work. Um, it is a lot of interview-based work, a lot of research-based work, um, and uh, a, a, the goal is always to be listening to the people who live right around the theater and hearing what they want to hear stories about and, um, and you know, finding those stories or working with them to find stories. Maybe um, we do a lot of that type of work through interview theater. Um, and then also to, to be able to take some, some risks, I think that uh, like Lord A and B theaters don't necessarily always get to take um, because we are smaller um, in terms of, of budget. Um, and, um, <laughs> Yes, that was what I was referring to, network of ensemble theaters. Um, so yeah, so I think I think there's a lot of of there's place where we can take have more risk taking in terms of the type of work we do and the way we do it and the way we engage with our community. Um, and then of course regional theater, um, you know, talking about um, Lord Houses or you know is is a, a solid season of work. Um, that I think um, is great, uh, wonderful for, for a community to have in terms of um, 
uh, understand, you know, coming back each month or each every other month um, and understanding a vision of, of for instance, uh, Hart Hartford Stage, um, for instance, understanding uh, the artistic director's vision and seeing that over a season of time. And then also being able to, you know, um, have audience members compare and, uh, you know, really bring those shows together and in their minds and think about how they relate to each other. Thanks so much, Julia. Does anyone else have any reflections, um, any different opinions on any of that? No, I I I, I co-sign on on all of that in terms of the definitions and and you know, Julia, as when you were sharing something that I was thinking about is that when I think about sort of community definitions and sort of and how how we work when we think about community theater professional theater, theater that is rooted in community. I was thinking about systems that the systems that we have to use in a community context are different than the systems we have to use in a professional context. One of the things that we're trying to think about at Long Wharf Theater as a, you know, as a lort, as a historically lort professional regional theater is there's a difference between being a community theater, which I came up from. Um, I, you know, I have a life in the theater because of El Teatro Campesino, where we were making theater on the flatbed trucks in the fields of California, versus um, a professional theater. You know, I, I, um, I, I think you can be, you can be. Um, you can still be a professional theater that is rooted in the community. And I think that's the distinction that I think we have to make. And I think that's the, I think the work that I think you're doing, Julia, and that you're, you're talking about is community-based um, is so important actually to the ecosystem. Um, and I, I just think that, you know, we talked about this a little bit yesterday when we were on our prep call with Derek, is like, how do we as a, as a, as a larger community and as a field, begin to really disrupt the mythologies that we have when we think about what it means to be a community-based theater, or even a theater that's rooted in community. Um, maybe the word community is the wrong word, um, you know, because we don't often define what that means. Um, one of the other intentional shifts that we're trying to make at Long Wharf Theater is to, is to use the word in a plural sense, not community, but communities, um, that's also has, you know, that, that also has to be a part of our work. How do we interrogate that and talk about that? So those are just some reflections that are coming up as I, as I hear Julia's terrific reflections. Thanks so much, Jacob. Bronwyn, did you want to add anything to that? Um, I don't have anything new to add, except that uh, in our talk the other day, in I, I come from a devised theater background. Um, I went to Pig Iron, and a lot of the work that we did in our the second half of our of the graduation year was based in community. Uh, so it was working with other artists and others in the local community area, different communities, um, and creating theater that. In our minds, I, I believe we didn't think there were any less professional than like a full pig iron production that was done, say, at the Fringe Festival. Uh, so I think in what Julia and Jacob have stated, I agree with the definitions that Julia spoke of, uh, but thinking about a different way of discussing like, quote unquote, community theater or community theater that's based in the community, like coming up with a different way of talking about it. Um, so it doesn't necessarily uh, polarize like, okay, this is professional and this is a community theater and this is community based where I've seen many productions that don't have the same uh, budget as a professional theater that in my mind are just as professional as like a, a theater done at the public or uh, it's just the what you garner from it is is um, 
a different takeaway. And I think uh, even finding other spaces that that one can perform in uh, someone who's a performer, uh, it takes away that idea of professional, even though I'm not, I'm not saying that's a bad word, but, um, like if you were going to do theater in, in a, an obscure type of a space, somebody might consider that to be less professional, but the quality of the work may be way better than what you might see uh, a production in an actual professional theater. So I think it's like breaking down those barriers somehow um, and how we talk about it because I know even in my own community here uh, there are performers who don't want to engage with a certain type of a organization because they can't get paid. Um, and I know that that's a big issue for performers, but it doesn't mean that the work has to be any less, um, I guess, is, is, is what I'm sort of trying to get at. Yeah, that really, that really resonates for me just to, just to jump in, because as you, as you were sharing, I was also just thinking about, you know, as we, as we, the invitation to disrupt, I think, some of the mythologies that we have when we hear sort of community-based theater or community theater. Um, you know, I, I wonder if the invitation is also about um, how we think about output. That that when we that when we center community, um, or that when we center a community-based context and how we make the work. Um, you know, um, that it's. It's about relationships. When we center a community context, I think it's about relationships. It's about process over product. I think it's about inviting more questions. Um, I think it's about really interrogating the thing of like, what does artistic excellence mean? Like, I think that's like really, right? We hear that all the time. We value artistic excellence. We value artistic rigor. Um, and I just wonder if like, we have to really think about those things relative to these new models that I think we're trying to, um, pilot as we move as we try to move the field forward yeah and on that same line in term in terms of i just wanted to uh agree wholeheartedly with uh jacob's just um definition of community versus communities right um in hartford which is i guess a, a mid-sized city geographically it's a fairly small city um and we have uh many communities and um, there are overlapping communities. Uh, people belong to more than one, but you know, neighborhood alone is is a can be a very divisive um uh, a, a you know a not a barrier but a line, right? A line in the sand. And so we we talk about that a lot. And that's really that's real too, because we're also talking about who gets funding, right? What what um neighborhood gets the um the influx of money that it needs and so forth. So I, yeah, I just wanted to back that up in terms of, I don't know, maybe, maybe we need to stop using the word community at all because it's becoming a, a, a euphemism and, and um, sort of, um, I mean, I, and I think it also involves like code switching and, you know, like things that white people are afraid to say and so forth. So um, it's a concept that maybe maybe has had its time. I would love to pull out a question that it seems like we've kind of been dancing around a little bit. And Jacob, you brought this up, um, which is around this idea of artistic excellence. And I'm curious in hearing you reflect on kind of how that phrase has been used, but also in thinking about new ways to use it and what we're really looking for. Um, when we talk about excellence and yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's something that I'm that I'm just really thinking deeply about as 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 we transition, uh, you know, the organization that I'm honored to be a part of, which is Long Wharf, you know, we've um, some may or may not know this, but uh, so I um, Long Wharf Theater has <laughs> Um, been in the building uh, on the outskirts of the city for almost 60 years. Um, and earlier this year, our board of directors made the decision to um, leave the building. So to no longer be anchored by one space, 
um, and instead to become an itinerant theater company to create and make work in spaces all around the region and and in the city of New Haven. You know, the idea the the idea is that um, you don't necessarily need a stage in four walls to tell great stories and to have an impact. Um, and and the kind of larger idea animating our decision is that theater um, belongs to everyone. Um, Oscar Eustace at the Public Theater talks about culture belongs to everyone. Um, and so we feel like we can really manifest that um, by not being anchored to a space um, any longer. And if there was ever a moment to really rethink our models and to try to push the American theater forward, we also felt like, you know, this is the this is the moment. Um, I remember during the pandemic, we had a, an artistic congress where we brought together leaders from across the country to talk about um, the state of the American theater and what are what is our responsibility to the field in terms of moving us forward. And Luis Alfaro, the great playwright, said, "The great pause has become the great possibility." And so we really took that as a, a real charge. Like, how can we use this pause? to lean into imagination and possibility. So as you can imagine, not being tied to a building, this question of, well, what about artistic excellence? I feel like the work's not gonna be as good if I see something in a library or outside in a park. And what I say, or what I've been saying to, to those folks is give us a chance. Give us a chance to figure this out. Let's, let's, let's together in community, Let's redefine what artistic excellence means for, for our theater company and for our city and for our region. Um, I'm also thinking about, you know, I, I was a producer at the public theater and the, the best art that we made was when we took professionals and non-professionals together to make a musical, which is a part of the public works program where we would adapt Shakespeare and do these, um, there were these massive participatory pageants at the Delacourt Theater. And not only was it the kind of the right thing to do, but it was the best art we made, um, I think, as a theater company. So another, again, another way to disrupt maybe some of the mythologies about how we think about um, community-based theater. Yeah, and I, I absolutely agree. And I think also we can, one thing that we can sort of siphon off um, from artistic excellence is, is the discussion of production values. Um, so production values being one thing, meaning literally how big your budget is to make, uh, to make this work. And, um, aside from, from paying the actors, we're talking about, um, design and tech and, and a lot of times that gets, uh, wove and it is part of artistic excellence, but it doesn't have to be at a certain level of financed at a certain level to be to be artistically excellent or to to you know have rigor um i think something that um going back to in, art that's that's probing um you know artists that are are committed um and also um not just committed to the work that they're doing but committed to communicating um with the audience both in the moment and after um and and yeah, in terms of that pause, I think we're, you know, asking a lot of questions, a lot of good questions that should have come up a long time ago um, about uh, what theater is and why we need it. You know, um, I teach uh, theater history and the whole, you know, I start the course by saying there's been theater as long as there's been humans because we've need, we need it. That's basically what I try to come back to throughout the whole course. Um, and so defining theater from that point, starting with ritual, starting with storytelling, start, you know, I think um, all of those things contribute to artistic excellence uh, in a way that um, just maybe isn't always recognized. I think a question that I have is, I think something that I'm hearing in, from all of you is I think there's um, a lot of value in, you know, meeting people where they are, whether that's physically or, um, you know, culturally, whatever that is. And I'm wondering, you know, I think in some ways community theaters are um, at an advantage in that or theaters that don't have a space like you were talking about, Jacob, um, you know, can like physically move in that way. But I'm wondering, 
and sorry, I'm realizing I'm talking really fast. Um, I'm wondering what a regional theater or a commercial theater, and I'm already steering away from using the word professional theater, um, but I'm wondering what lessons they can learn or um, how they can do that work as well. One of the things that I think um, smaller companies in general um, have be out of necessity that maybe is agility. Um, and I think that's something, you know, the, the, the larger you are, whether it be um, budget or, or building or, or numbers of staff, um, it maybe becomes a little less hard to stay agile. Um, and the, you know, if you are, if, if you, if you don't have as much, whether it is to carry around with you or um, a lot of other things, whatever, where your board is and so forth, um, Heartbeat has been able to be really agile in the in our 20 years um, and respond not only to, you know, what our, our audiences wanted, but what we needed, what was going on with us, what was going on, you know, during the recession, for instance. And we've had to uh, hate this word now because it's an edu-speak word, pivot, <laughs> Um but it's it's in used in in education of like no, no don't don't worry about it you just got to pivot and do something differently but um we have been able to to turn turn another direction and um do something a little different than we have been easier i think than than larger um uh companies the, the other thing is like learning a certain amount of resourcefulness um that you have to have i'm thinking about um you know there were Heartbeat has a theater, um, but we didn't always. It's for the last ten years, we have, um, and we one we used to do a series, uh, a, a show uh, called Ebenezer, a Hartford Holiday Carol based on a Christmas Carol, and we went to each neighborhood and performed. And so our theaters were, you know, the West Indian Social Club and the Charter Oak Cultural Center and a Union Hall and so forth. Um, but that it just that brings up a whole other. Uh, slew of questions and things that we have to figure out of doing theater in a non-theater space. Um, so figuring out those day to day, whether it's like, is there a toilet in this space for the actors? <laughs> you know, those are things that I think um, we get we get used to, um, and maybe could, um, yeah, that it could be learned from. Yeah, thank you. I would love to hear your perspective on this, Bronwyn, as um, an independent artist. Um, can you just repeat the question one more time, Derek, so I could clarify? Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, um, you know, a lot of our conversation has been around, I think, meeting people where they are. And I'm wondering, um, you know, what it looks like for a theater, a regional theater or a commercial theater or a theater that has its own space. How can they still meet the community where they are? Um, yeah. Um, so I guess as a independent artist, um, <laughs> uh, for me, I don't know, the kind of work that I'm most interested in creating probably comes from a more of a devised place. Um, and sometimes I find that with professional, I'll say equity theaters that are and I'll just state like in the area that I'm located in, uh, there's a tendency to not use local performers. Um, and I find that a bit disgruntling. Um, there's a tendency to think that the better performers come from New York City or Boston or somewhere else. Uh, and I'm not quite sure I understand why that is, even though I know that things have, the climate has changed slightly, but it still appears to me that when you go to audition for a company that is quote unquote professional um, or an equity theater, the tendency seems to be not to look locally. Um, and I, I, that 
to me is a turnoff, I guess, because I feel like there's a lot of local people who, whether they have a professional resume or not, um, doesn't matter. I mean, it really depends on what happens when you show up at the audition. Um, I guess the other thing in that realm as someone who still goes out and auditions and performs, uh, whether I'm creating my own material, which has its own um, dilemmas, uh, because when you're creating your own work from a devised place, a lot of times you don't have a big budget. You do have to be resourceful. Um, you do have to find things um, in your own way in order to produce that piece. So uh, that requires like an individual artist like myself, um, if I'm creating original material, I have to work with my community. Um, there's really no if, ands, or buts about it. You you are community based, and you are working with your community uh, because you probably don't have a space and you don't have all of the resources exactly in your back pocket. Um, and I haven't seen as much outreach from professional theaters when I've actually tried to engage in creating work. Uh, and maybe reach out to a bigger company that might be willing to like, can I use their space or um, make connections in that way? There hasn't really been a hand across the aisle like saying, yeah, come here, we can use our space for free or maybe you could do a work in progress performance here. Um, that hasn't really, I have not seen that sort of uh, present itself, at least in, in my understanding. Um, so I feel like there's a disconnect a little bit. Um, you know, a community theater, uh, is usually more open to something of that. It's, even if they have a space, they may be more willing to let a small group, uh, or an individual artist, uh, come in and, and use the space they they seem a little less uh intim uh, intimidated is not the right word but uh they seem a little less uh confined to their concern about being an equity theater or a professional theater um so there's sort of for me at least as a person who prefers to devise theater and create it from an original place um you're relied you're reliant upon applying for grants or finding money outside of yourself unless you happen to be independently wealthy uh to create your own work um and it's it's been frustrating that other professional whether they're companies or organizations are less willing to help uh like an individual artist or um, without applying for a grant or getting donations or, or what have you. Um, and then if I go and audition for a community theater and I have an equity card, there's a problem there. And then if you go to an equity theater, at least in more rural areas, like in Vermont or in New Hampshire, there's this, there's also a stigma around casting local actors. Now, these are things that we weren't necessarily talked about earlier, but as a person, as an individual artist, I've found frustration in all of those avenues. Um, so I don't have an answer for it, except that the type of work that interests me the most is how to create original work using my community, my neighbors, my uh, creating theater that might be, it doesn't have to be in a traditional space. In fact, I prefer work that isn't in a traditional space, but all of that requires income or resources that sometimes are not as easy to find. Um, <laughs> I don't know, that was sort of a long winded answer to your question, but um, I'm just kind of speaking from a a place for myself and my own frustration around around creating work and and or how to help others in my community who want to 
create work and or maybe audition for a company uh, that might strictly want to hire actors for some reason out of a bigger city than their local actors. I don't know if anybody who could speak to that, but. <laughs> Bronwyn, I think that what you're raising, I just, I just want to like, just amplify and just like, I think all the points are so poignant and powerful. I think this, the, the point that you're also making about like, you know, that we say that we want to be in relationship to our city, to our region, to our community, but we, then we don't even start there in terms of the treasure chest that is right in front of us. You know, I think when you put that stake in the ground to say, you know, we want to be in relationship to our communities, um, that it like opens up, I think, possibility. Um, and I think that it's it's one of the it's it that in itself is one of the ways that we can be a more community centered professional theater, even if that's something, you know, I still want to be alert theater. I still want to be an off Broadway theater. Great. Do that. But what are the values that are sort of guiding your work? What are the stakes in the ground that allow you to still center your communities and the people that you say you want to serve in a, in a more intentional way? I think that that's just really powerful. And it's something that it's an active shift that we are trying to make and that I think we have made at Longworth Theater. Do we have more work to do? Absolutely. Have we gotten it right always? No. Um, but we're learning and we're growing and we're evolving. And and also trying to really think about the, you know, the value of emergence. How can we be emergent in our process? The other thing that um that Derek, I think you um you asked us to reflect on is just like the whole idea of meeting audiences where they are. Man, oh man, is that just so powerful, especially as we think about, I think for Long Wharf again, this transition, it's been, y'all, it's been really hard for folks to wrap their heads around, wait, what? Itinerant theater, leaving your building. You're, you're, you're asking me to imagine something different and new, you know, change is hard, I think, for, for, for folks, not, not all folks, but for many folks. And so this idea of like, come on the journey with us. Part of the reason why we made this change is because we do actually want to be around for the next 60 years. I think about the thing that Ty Defoe, you know, said to me, I think about the thing Delena Studi said to me, which is if you're not thinking seven generations ahead, you're not thinking far enough out. So help us think seven generations ahead. If we would have stayed in that building, then I think the legacy of the company would have really been in jeopardy and we wouldn't have been able to imagine the possibility seven generations ahead. So we have to keep amplifying that message. Yeah. Um, I just also want to bring up two, uh, two things that come out of what Bronwyn was saying. Um, and one is in terms of it, that the act, the local actor versus the actor from New York um, or so forth. One of the ways I think that um, one of the things that that works um, well against that is ensemble, um, having a having a set ensemble, however you define your ensemble. Right. It could be five people. It could be 20 people. It could be only people that live in uh, your city or it can be people from um, throughout the country. But when you are committing to um, working with a specific ensemble, that that often is a stake in the ground. Um, because it's you, you're working together and you're saying, okay, well, we have this project, we go to this person because they're an ensemble member that's looking to do um something. And then the other thing is that there's that there be that there's a very clear way into the ensemble for us. Um, that you know, many uh of of our ensemble, um, we have several members who started with us as youth um in our youth play institute and uh and came up and and um are now are now ensemble members. So those two things together, I think, put that stake in the ground in the community where you're in or the communities where you're in. The other thing that um I think uh to to bring up and you mentioned it a little bit, Bronwyn, is is how the union is changing um or and what what they need to do to change. So um, you know, actors equity was um there was, you know, been a lot a, a, a light shown on it in terms of its inequity. Um, and who it's serving in terms of its uh, union members. And so uh, I think we need to keep pushing that. And, and there's a, a flexibility there, um, you know, of, of so, that, so that the barrier of an equity house or a non-equity house um, isn't the thing that's going to keep people out 
um, one way or the other. Now that's, there's always been that option. Heartbeat always has, you know, we're not an equity house, but we have, we always have, you know, at least half our contracts are equity contracts. And so that's always been there, but there's other ways as well um, that we can open up those, uh, those sort of silos of definitions of, of uh, working artist. Yeah, thank you so much, Julia. Did anyone have any other reflections on the actors' equity questions, complexities around that? Um, in that case, I will pivot us a little bit, and it's not really a pivot, um, but I think something that, again, we've touched on a few times, um, and I've heard some examples and I'm wondering if I can just push us to go even deeper is, um, you know, this question of working in community gets thrown around a lot. Um, it's, I think it can be kind of a buzzword. Um, and I'm wondering, like, what does that really look like? What does it look like to do that right? Um, I would just love to hear examples or philosophies around that that you might have. Um, for, I mean, for Heartbeat, I think it's always been about um, representation in this, uh, of our city. Um, you know, we have a, a predominantly black and brown city, 85%. Um, and, uh, and so we want that to be reflected in, in our audience. Um, that, you know, we, we want to make sure that we are um, not just creating theater for the white theater goers who have been doing it for a long time. Um, that's a big part of it for us, really. Um, the other, the other thing that we look at is how many people, um, who who in the audience, um, how if they've ever been to a theater before, um, how often they go to a theater, if they go once a year, if they go to multiple theaters, right? We wanna we wanna reflect our community in that way, our our city in that way too, um, in terms of bringing in new theater goers. Um, so I, those are two ways. I mean, there's multiple, but those are two ways that I think we just literally look around and, and you know, can get a sense, start to get a sense of what we're doing. Um, I would just offer it just so at Long Wharf Theater, we try to organize our work around three core pillars. Um, the pillars are artistic innovation, radical inclusion, and kaleidoscopic partnerships. And it's that last, it's that last pillar of partnership that we really are trying to lean into, especially as we do this, this, this transition. But I also think that when I think about the future of the American theater, I think more and more is going to rely on like revolutionary partnerships, people coming together to actually make the work and be in relationship to communities. So I think the way that the way that we sort of are trying to do it at Long Wharf is um like to actually go into the community, like who are the who are the community organizations that are um, have real relationships with the different neighborhoods all across New Haven? So like one partnership that we have that's been going on for um, um, going on a decade is with the New Haven Free Public Library, which has branches in all of the neighborhoods across the city of New Haven. So when we say that we want to be in community or in right relationship with our community, rather than us rather than us knowing what that looks like or, or us thinking that we know what the community wants, we have to actually rely on the folks that are actually in the community, like the library or like a junta, which is specifically supporting our Latinx population here in New Haven or uh, the pride center, which is supporting um, primarily our BIPOC community, our transgender community. Um, so that's how we're, um, and, and so it's a, it's a formal and informal network. Um, but but again, it's that it's that it's you know of our three pillars, that last pillar of of partnership, is is really the piece that we're trying to you know lean into as we think about what it means to be in community. Yeah. Yeah. Just to re oh, sorry, bring that. You're absolutely right. I mean, if if there aren't partnerships with institutions that are already in 
um, in the various communities that you're in, then there's then there's something missing. There's a piece missing, right? Um, and some a, a lot of times, I think those be the best partnerships come from um, work that's created, you know, with that in partnership with with whatever organization it is. So, um, you know, doing uh, we had an ongoing project with um, SCIU 1199 workers um, for of 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 telling stories of uh certified nurses assistants um and so we you know it was over the course of a couple of years and we've done that um with both with literally just with streets but then also um also with other organizations that have a specific you know people reaching out to us too um that have a specific story that they want to tell or message that they want to get out there or questions that they want to push and will come to heartbeat and say, you know, can we work on something together to get that out there? I, that's always, you know, incredibly rich. Um, Karen, I see your question, but I want to um, make sure I make, we make space for Bronwyn. Um. Thanks, Jacob. <laughs> um, well, I'll just speak to two projects um, in relation to partnership uh, because as a individual creator, I I find it really enriching and important to reach out to different communities to work with them. And uh, one in particular um, that, or there's two that I'll speak to, but um, when I was at the end of my graduate program in Philadelphia, uh, myself and another graduate, we worked with an elderly home uh, not far from the school. And we met with them several times and the discussions were about what they needed, not what we wanted to do. <laughs> and what was really exciting was posing those questions to not just the director of the elderly home, but we actually sat down with elders and had discussions about what would interest them and if we were to create a project um what what do they need um rather than us imposing our idea upon them and actually it was really simple um a lot of the elders wanted to talk about their community uh in in philly and fishtown area um or what's called Fishtown. Uh, I think it's Kensington and West Kensington. I don't know. I can't remember the exact names, but it was Fishtown. Um, and how their community had changed, but they wanted to do it by, um, they also wanted to get exercise, so they liked to walk. And um, they. we decided that we would do like a walking conversation uh, start out with doing walking and, co and conversing with one another. So in groups, we would take walks um, and we did it once a week and we were taking notes and they were telling stories. So when they were walking, they would look at a building or look at an area or a park that maybe had changed or uh, had transitioned into something else. And for some of them, that was uh, a nostalgic memory and they were either sad or maybe they were upset about it or or whatever but there was a story behind it and so there were all these stories that came out of the these walking and then invariably they'd want to stop and have coffee so there was that element to it but we took these stories and then started to create them not just as um theatrical pieces, but as a visual, like visual art. So then they were also drawing and painting from these stories. Um, so, and what I found so exciting about that was that we didn't come in and push our thought or idea upon them. They sort of, we sat down and had several conversations and it was in those conversations that the most rich material sort of came. And then hearing them reflecting their stories as we were walking. Um, and it was almost like as if, gee, I felt like we were kind of already doing theater as we were walking down down the street. <laughs> like, it, and that is like theater in its own little way. Um, then the other real quick uh, project that I had a chance to work with a good friend of mine who unfortunately recently passed away, um, 
but he's a visual, excuse me, he's a visual artist. He only died like a week ago, so I'm, I'm sorry if I'm crying. Um, but he wrote a book and he had worked with children in Nepal, uh, in India, and he was working with them on Zoom doing visual art based on the book that he had written uh, with the story was a Nepali story. Um, and so I, it was all on Zoom um, and it was during COVID. So I was working with them, not just on Charles' story and illustrations of visual art, but we were also creating theater from that book. And then we sort of extended our our work together and I started working with the students um, and these are all young kids uh, anywhere from 8 to 16 17 maybe at the the oldest um, and we started talking about COVID and how COVID had affected them and created stories and movement through Zoom um, and when we were talking about COVID, I really wanted to hear it from their standpoint um, in their country and in Nepal, not not placing my ideas from the Americans, uh, my views of COVID. Um, so, and that's still in the works, but um, just how to engage in partnerships in a different way and sort of asking the question of like, what do you need? As opposed to the artist coming in and saying, well, this is my idea and this is what I want to do or, or whether you're with an ensemble or an individual artist um, and sort of how to really make it a partnership and a conversation from there coming from them, not, not from the artist. And sorry for crying. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bronwyn, and please yeah. do not apologize for that. And thank you for being vulnerable and bringing that. And I would love if you could share that artist's name so that we could recognize oh, it. Sure. Uh, his name was Charles Norris Brown, and he was in his 70s. I'm so sorry for your loss. Thank you. Oh, th thanks. Thank you. <laughs> thanks. Um. In our last five minutes, I would love to field some questions that have been coming up in the chat. Um, and I think the first one that I see, and I'm sorry, I know I'm probably missing some from earlier in the call, but I see, can you talk more about the idea of kaleidoscopic partnerships and what does that mean to you? Um, sure. <laughs> um... Uh, I think that, you know, New Haven, um, is a really, uh, like racially diverse city. Um, and so, uh, we intentionally have made the decision that when we think about like kaleidoscope seeing, um, the, the diversity of our city, um, on our stages, I think we're specifically focused on racial diversity. Um, and so, um, going back to what I was saying earlier, how do we engage partners that serve the different communities and the different populations? Um, so, you know, uh, who are the partners that are specifically um, focused on our Black and Brown community? Who is the partner that's um, like Junta that's focused on really serving the um, uh, the Latinx community? Um, and 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 I think we are, but we are trying to expand. I really appreciate the question, Karen. Like how, like trying to expand the definition of kaleidoscope because we know that there are many communities that need to be a part of that definition. Um, like I'm thinking about how are we supporting like the narrow diverse community? How are we supporting? Um, I mean, we're we will likely do a play next season by a disabled artist who has cerebral palsy. So how are we? How are we really in really in partnership and in deep relationship with our disabled community? Um, so so it's a it's 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 an emergent definition. Yeah, I'm really grateful though for the question. Thanks so much, and I'm sorry to kind of be rushing us along, but I also really wanted to make time for this other question from Claudia, which is, can anyone speak to using digital platforms in your community producing? 
I can speak to that in terms of some things, things I've been grappling with, um, because as we're um, in year three here of the pandemic, my gut is to be like, no, I don't want the virtual platform, you know, because I felt, feel so isolated and felt so, um, you know, so, so two-dimensional. And yet when I think about things that have, um, whether it's meetings or talks like this or, or theater pieces that have happened, um, on a virtual platform, I, you can't help but notice the reach um, in terms of geography. And that's like, that's been really wonderful and, and also just eye-opening in terms of, um, of how, how set we get in our geographic mindset, right? Um, of, you know, this is where I am. This is what we think. This is what we do. And so be, having people from all over the world be able to tune in obviously opens that up. And so I, I don't have, all I know is that I've been really thinking to myself, okay, so where, so obviously this is the virtual realm is a, a place where theater needs to keep being and, but how does that work? Um, and actually I think Nifa has done a very interesting job with it in terms of this conference, um, in terms of mixing up the in-person um, and virtual, but I think it's something that's like just, we're just starting to explore. Yeah, and I can also just just jump in just to give you another example, Claudia, um, that one of the things that Longworth Theater is doing, we have a, we're doing a program called the New Haven Play Project, thanks to the support of Doris Duke, where we are um, creating a film um, with um, our Muslim community. And the idea is how do we create bridges between Muslim communities and non-Muslim communities? So we're going to create a, a film and also a series of short films, and then we're going to then use a, a virtual platform to share that to share these stories of the Muslim community across the state of Connecticut. Um, so that's that's just one, one example of how we're trying to engage as many communities as possible using a virtual platform. Thank you so much. Um, we are running out of time, but I want to invite any final reflections if you have it um, before we wrap up. And if not, that's okay too. I would just say thank you for this conversation. Um, it's uh, it's really nice to have. It's nice to check in. Um, you know, if, if we're talking about this ecosystem, it's it's nice to check in with the different parts of that uh, system. So I'm I'm appreciative. I'm glad I was part of that. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much. I wish we had another hour or two for this conversation, but of course we don't. Um, we do have another um, session coming up at 2.15, and I have to look at my agenda here. That will be a performance from the Ensemble of Color. Um, so I'm super excited about that. Um, I would love to see you all in the chat in 15 minutes. Um, thank you all so much. Thank you so much to our panelists, especially. This was such a great conversation. Thank you, everyone. It's been a great conversation to have with you all. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much.